All right, everybody, shall we begin in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you as always for the ability to gather together openly around your word. Uh, we ask that you continue as we study uh, your word through your servant, St. Luke, to us, uh, that we gain a greater appreciation of uh, who you are as revealed by your son um, and what he came to do for us uh, and how he restored our relationship with you by overcoming sin, death, and the devil. We thank you for this beautiful and wonderful gift. And as we continue to talk about the Beatitudes uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, help that to edify our faith and, and, uh, and shape our lives and how we interact with one another and with the world as a whole. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Pastor Hasselbrook, I believe, had said that you uh, had gotten into the Golden Rule last week, maybe, which I think on our sheets is number three. Um, so we know, we know the Golden Rule, um, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Um, and so, um, was there anything else on the Golden Rule? Did he get through that whole thing? Anybody remember? <laughs> Clear back to a week ago. I don't, I don't remember during the Golden Rule. Do we? I don't remember during no, the Golden Rule. Was... The blessing and the yeah. Okay, so he was still introducing. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so let's see if I can kind of get us. This is the difficulty about two different pastors doing the same study as we move at different places and paces. So um, where we should be starting in these notes. Um, so do you have? Does it say Luke twenty or six twenty seven through thirty eight at the top of your notes? Luke chapter 6, on the very first page of your notes, what, it, what does it say? 2 through 49. Okay. All right. Well, maybe, maybe you don't have the right ones. Because what we should be doing, we had actually finished um, before we took our break for the summer. We'd actually gotten through the woes uh, and the Beatitudes. Um, and so we should be uh, beginning at uh, verse 27 and going through 38 is where we should be. Um, so your notes don't reflect that? No? Yeah, they call them. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Then that makes me happy. So our notes are there. So uh, Mark, on the ones that you have, number one, does it say the first imperative Jesus gives is a radical one on number one? On number one? Yeah. I'm lost. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let me see, Jerry. Okay, so what's the note? I don't even have notes. I don't know what my Okay, yeah, sure. So this is it. Um, so, Pastor, unfortunately, when Pastor Hasselbrook uh, printed these for you, he didn't keep the numbers that I had put in there. So, um, where I normally would number the questions and say, hey, we're on number one, we finished yeah. with number three, they're not on there for you. So fortunately, I'll just be able to tell you where we are. So at the very top, we're just going to quickly go over the very top paragraph, Jerry, that you're at, okay. that starts with the first imperative Jesus gives is a radical one. So what we've been kind of talking about here is the fact that when Jesus begins to give kind of this way of life, um, he is, he's fundamentally changing what it means to be a human being here. Um, at no other time did anyone tell someone to love their enemies. And this is the first imperative. Does anybody remember what an imperative is? What's an, in, in grammar, English grammar, what's an imperative? It's like a, it's a command or command. It is a command, right? A command or a demand, right? So um, if I tell one of my kids, go clean your room, that's an imperative in, in English. Um, and some of these other languages, uh, the form of the word shows that it's a command or a demand. Uh, and this is what Jesus is giving here. When he says, love your enemies, that's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. It's a command. He is telling us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so this is, this is what he's telling us. So... Um, what we're doing, uh, if, you're, if you're looking, so on our sheet, it should be on the very first page of, of the sheets that you have. The very first page and, and the beginning, that very beginning paragraph starts with the first imperative Jesus gives is a radical one. In our Bibles, we are on Luke chapter 6, verse 27. So in our Bibles, Luke 6, 27. 
And you'll see that Luke 6, 27 says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. So this is what I'm talking about, right? So um, we are being called to do something that's not natural to us, right? It's not natural to love your enemy. It's natural to hate your enemy. Um, from uh, a war fighting perspective in the Marine Corps, we, before you go to battle, you do everything you can to dehumanize that enemy. And you almost need to do that so that you can actually do the things in war that you're called upon to do. It's really hard. It would be really hard to, to take the life of an enemy you love. So it's, the, it's really the opposite of what Jesus is telling us to do, which is something that I've had to struggle with coming back from war quite a bit. Um, and, but Jesus is telling us to do something that's very different, very radical than, any, than anywhere else in, in any other civilization. Um, so um, the enemies uh, that Jesus is talking about is something that we should ask ourselves because that's, that's pretty important. Um, if we go to, um, to six, in chapter 6 to verse 22, we read, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. So these, this is the definition of the enemy. Who's the, who are our enemies that we're called to hate? Or I mean to love, sorry. <laughs> who are our enemies that we're called to love? According to verse 22 here. Yeah, the, one, the ones that what? Not necessarily, but why? Why do they hate you? They hate you on account of what? Because you're, yes, you're a follower. because you're a follower of Jesus. These are the people that we're told to love. The ones that hate us because of our faith in Christ. Those are the ones that we're supposed to pray for. Those are the ones that we're supposed to love. The ones that hate us on account of our faith in Jesus. And that's important. That's why in our prayers, so often in the church, we do pray for those who persecute the church, that God would turn their hearts. And a lot of times in the church, history of the church, when is the, the greatest amount of people that hated the church come to faith? Does anybody know? When Christians are dying for their faith and dying in a Christian way. The word martyr is taken from a Greek word that means to bear witness. So in, in Luke's gospel, when he says that he was talking to eyewitnesses, that word is martyr. Not necessarily in that context, meaning people that died for the faith, because it simply, it also means to bear witness. But the reason why we get the word martyr in English is because someone who gives their life for the faith, without recanting that faith, without getting rid of that faith, and, and dies for it in the faith, gives the most powerful of witnesses, right? Uh, you've probably heard me talk about one of my favorite, uh, my favorite martyrs, if you, can, if you can say that, if that's an okay thing to say. But the one that gives me the most comfort uh, was a man named Polycarp. Has anybody ever heard of Polycarp? I know kind of a funny name. Polycarp lived um, in the first couple centuries after uh, Christ had ascended, so in the very early church. And Polycarp was, I think, 84 years old. And he was hauled before the, the Roman leaders. And the governor essentially begged him to recant his faith. Because they were putting Christians to death for their faith. And they, the governor didn't want to kill an old man. And he told him, he said, you're old, live, recant your faith, live out your days in peace. And Polycarp looked at this guy and said, my Lord has not given up on me for 84 years. I will not give up on him now. Oh. <sighs> And then they tried to burn him to death, and the fire wouldn't light. So then they ran a sword through him, and he died for his faith. 84 years old, could have easily said, you know what, I've, I've had a long life and not ready to go yet. And what did he do? He said, no, my Lord has not denied me. I will not deny him. That is a powerful witness, yes. right? A powerful, powerful witness. And so this ability to to pray for those who persecute the church, um, that God would use whatever way possible to turn their hearts so that, that they would come to faith and know the peace that we have. Oftentimes, this happens in its greatest extent when people die for their faith and they stay in the faith, right? It's one thing to say, I believe, 
when nothing bad is happening. It's, it's pretty easy to be a Christian when, it, when it's easy to be a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. It's becoming harder and harder in our day and age to truly be a Christian, to, to find ourselves in the Word of God and to use that, that Word as the lens through which we interpret the things of this world. That's getting harder and harder. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that in our country we're very soon going to have people dying for the faith, but we might. We might. Um, we just had uh, a group of 11 pro-life activists that were arrested for trying to prevent abortions, and they're being charged by the U.S. the federal government for, for not allowing people to enter an abortion facility. And the witness that these folks are giving right now is tremendous, the tremendous witness. They're facing... I think 11 years in prison if, if they get convicted and given the full brunt of the law because they sat and didn't let people come into an abortion clinic. So these things are happening in, in, our, in our society where you try to stand up for the faith and protect those who cannot protect themselves and bad things are happening. All right. So. Do, you, do you think that God gives people the grace and the strength to, to do that? You betcha. You betcha. Yeah, because certainly not... I mean, who among us here is like, yeah, I really want to get killed in a horrific way for my faith. (laughs) No one does. We like our lives, right? We see them as a gift of God. And yet the, the, uh, the ability to bear up underneath those things, it has to be a gift of God. Because all good that we do is a gift of God, and it comes from him through the power of his Holy Spirit. Right, and, and we, we don't need to be ashamed of that. That's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Our Lord gave us that example. Yeah. Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. His human nature didn't want to go and suffer that horrific death. And yet, who came and tended to him in the garden before he went to the cross? Anybody remember? Angels. Angels came and attended to our Lord Jesus to help bolster him so that he could go and do the things that he needed to do, right? That's a beautiful example to us when we face difficult things, right? And most of the time, most of us, the worst that we're going to face in this world is someone simply calling us hateful or bigoted. They're, they're words, right? They're words. St. Paul calls them the flaming darts of the devil. But they're just words, Right? Sticks and stones. We said that as little kids. Words will never hurt me. And yet, a lot of us will not share the faith simply because we're afraid of what someone might say about us. But if you go to Ephesians 5, we have the shield that helps guide us and guard us against the flaming darts of the devil. And those things are important. So yes, God bolsters us. He protects us. Um, but he protects us through the knowledge of the word, right? If we don't know this, we're losing our protection, all right? Um, and I'm not saying that our protection is dependent upon something that we do, but the, our faith is strengthened through the word. Our faith is strengthened through being in the service to hear that word preached and to receive the body and blood of Christ, right? That is where we pull it on the full armor of God. The armor of God is all the gifts uh, that God gives us, and none of it is is on our own, right? So you've got you know the breastplate and the belt and, and the sword of, of truth, which is the word of God, um, and so we we have to use those things that God gives us to to be able to do it. Um, if we go back to Jesus' temptation in in the the wilderness, how does he answer Satan? What was with God's word? With God's word, right? The only weapon we have to fend off. That's why the the word is the sword, right? The only weapon we have to fend off the attacks of Satan is the word of God. And if we're not in it, and we don't read it, and we don't try to memorize it, and we we don't come to Bible study, and we don't come to church, we have put down the sword, and now we're just trying to fight with our own dukes. And Satan is going to beat you. (laughs) He's going to beat you. If If it's up to you and just your fists, he'll get you. We got to have the armor of God that protects us and the sword of the truth, which allows us to to fight back against Him, and that's what Jesus shows us, and that's that's a beautiful thing, um, and that's how we are able to not only stand up against the enemies that put pressure on us, 
but also continue to love them because we no longer have that heart of stone that's in our chest. God has given us that heart of flesh and he allows us then to pray for those who hate us. And I will tell you, if you, if you harbor hate against somebody, anger against somebody, and you begin to pray for them each and every day, God will eventually help, help rid you of that hate. I've told many of you that I had a lot of hate for the person that blew me up and broke my back, leading to me leaving the military. And it took me years of praying to let that go. And now I pray continually that God makes that man a Christian. I don't know who he is. You know, hiding bombs is a little bit of a cowardly way to fight. But So I don't know who he is. And yet I've prayed for him a lot because... My hope is that God would make him a Christian and I'd see him in heaven. Because then I don't have to worry about having metal in my back when I get up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so then moving on to the paragraph that starts, which should be number two, the overarching command of the first imperative is love. Everybody find that paragraph on your... So that'd be number two. The overarching command of the first imperative is love. The next six that follow from that... Describe the action that love takes. So the way Jesus has beautifully organized these commands, these imperatives for us, is he starts with the general, love your enemy. And then he tells us how we do that with these other imperatives. So then the first set of three has you, plural, all y'all, right, as we say in the country. Um, so if we're looking in Luke's gospel in chapter 6, we had in verse 27, Love your enemies and do good to those that hate you. But then in 28, we have bless those that curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one that strikes you on the cheek, offer the other. Um, actually, hold on. I think, I'm, I'm, I think do good is the, the first one. So how do you love your enemies? First, you do good, the, good to those that hate you. You bless those who curse you and you pray for those who abuse you. Those are the next three. All of those are plural you so it's, he's not saying you as an individual he's giving this to the church this is how the church loves her enemies we do good right well how do we do that at, the, at this congregation we we serve people with food i help people with the hack fund right we helped pay rent last week from some for someone that's not a member of this church um i've delivered food to a person that has actually cussed me out in the front of this church before. You were there <laughs> when that happened. But I've delivered food to that same individual. She doesn't remember that she cussed me out, but she did. Mm -hmm. And and I pray for her conversion, and I've delivered food to her several times, and I've helped her with, with things with her health and, and stuff like that. That is how the church begins to, to live this. I don't ask, when people call me and ask for help, I don't ask them, Are you a, do you believe in Jesus? Right off the bat. My help is not contingent upon that because we're, we're to do good to those that hate us. I first do the good, and then in doing the good, then I begin to share the faith, right? There are times, um, certainly the sharing of the faith is the most important. A lot of churches have gotten to the point where they just do the good and they never share the faith. That's wrong too. And yet there are times where you do have to meet an earthly need in order to be able to share the gospel. If a person is literally starving to death, and you say, <clears throat> man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Is that true and good and right and salutary to tell them? Yes! Are they going to have the opportunity for that seed of faith to grow if they die in front of you of starvation? No. Maybe not. <laughs> right? So sometimes you've got to meet the earthly need to prep the soil for the seed to enter into, right? right? So we meet the earthly need. We, we give them the bodily food so that I have opportunity to give them the spiritual food. Many of you know some of the things that, that we did during, um, during the, the lockdown of the pandemic to try to help people. Delivering food. I replaced the alternator in the lady's car on the side of the road, which was fun. Um, you'd be surprised how many people honk at you when you're in a clerical collar, elbow deep in someone's engine replacing an alternator. <laughs> and then I baptized her son. Wow. Nice. Right? I took care of an earthly need, which allowed me to share the faith, which allowed me to baptize a child. 
Now, I've prayed continually that that family would, would be gay here regularly, and they're not. And yet, the seeds of faith, it is not, I mean, we've, we've talked about this with the parable of the sower, right? We don't look at the soil, right? We don't make the judgment on if we think someone is going to receive the gospel. We just sow. And if you've ever, ever looked at the stained glass windows over at Oklahoma Avenue, they have a window of the parable of the sower, and I love it. It looks like the person sowing, that seed is shooting out of their hand like a fire hose. It's just going everywhere. That's how we should be. I don't look at the person and, and wonder, well, gee, if I put in this effort, do I think I'm going to get a return on it? No. You just sow. You just tell them. Right? And it doesn't matter if they be believe in Jesus at that point or not. It doesn't matter if they are opposed. There are many in this city that are, are very much opposed to our faith and our interpretation of the faith. And yet we continue to live out that faith and we share the gospel and we do all of those things because we're called to do them. Right? Um, so we do good to those that hate you. We bless those that curse you. Right? I know it's become uh, in common parlance, especially if you're from the South, well, God bless you. That's, a, that's almost a sarcastic way of, of throwing up a middle finger to someone <laughs> in certain areas in the South. But we shouldn't do that. We should, be, we should say that when people revile us. Our church sign out there has, has a, a message that says, God bless you. And that's there particularly. Right? I want God to be in the lives, working in the lives of even and especially the people that hate us. Because he is the one that's going to turn their heart, not us. He may use us to do that, which is beautiful and wonderful. And we give him thanks when that happens. But goodness, if it was dependent upon us and our own strength to bring people to faith, we'd be in big trouble. It's God. And he does so through this. So we bless people that curse us. And we pray for those who abuse us. And in the prayers of the church, as the church, we do this, right? We pray for those that persecute the church continually. Uh, we ask that God would turn their hearts and bring them to faith. So we do those things, and, and those are good and right for us to do. So those are the next three imperatives that are given to you, plural, meaning the church as a whole. After those... Um, so that next little paragraph down that starts with the next three imperatives are directed. This is still part of number two, so don't write number three yet. But they're directed to the individual. So now we've went from the general, right? Love your enemies. You, the church, my body, Jesus is saying, you love the enemies in these three ways. And now he's looking and saying, Jerry, as a member of my body, the church, this is how you as an individual participate in these things. So he goes from the general to the specific, right? To everybody, love your enemies. To the church, this is how you do it. And now to the individual believer, this is how Brandon does it. This is how Jerry does it, Richard, so on and so forth. So those next three are, to the one that strikes you on the cheek, offer the other. From the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Give to everyone who begs from you and the one who takes away your goods. Do not demand them back. I right, see this, these are the next, the next set. And so these examples that we give, right? Striking on the cheek. Um, giving the, the tunic in addition to the cloak. Now a lot of us, um, you know, if someone, if someone was going to come and, and rob you of your money, how many of us would say, well, here, take my coat? I mean... Take my coat as well. <laughs> this is what Jesus is yeah, telling us to do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm freezing. <laughs> it's cold out there. Come on, man. Um, we had, uh, I was teaching, was it last week, honey? Where I sat with that young man out here? Yeah, I think so. They all begin to run together, right? Um, I was teaching over at the rec center. I teach on Tuesday nights. I teach Latin class. And on Thursday nights with Linda, we do a, a book group that right now we're reading Pride and Prejudice. And um, uh, in, in that, I finished up that book group and I walked home and um, I uh, took my leave from Richard and Linda at the corner as I normally do. And I walked across the street and I saw a young man on a cell phone out here on the sidewalk. And um, 
he was on the cell phone facing the church, but he wasn't at the church. So I thought, well, maybe he's just texting or something like that as he was walking and, and stopped. And, and I came in and I, re I realized that uh, I had helped somebody in Latin before I'd went over there here and I'd left the light on in here because it was still sunny and I didn't realize that the light was still on. So I saw the light and I thought, oh no, I better run in. So I dropped off my books. I turned off the light. And as I was heading down, I saw the young man sit on the step and he was crying. And um, probably early 20s, um, uh, big, strong young man. And uh, so I quickly text Trish and I said, hey, I got, I got a guy over here that's crying out in front of the church. I'm going to go see what's going on. So if I'm not right home, I don't want you to worry. And I uh, told her I loved her and I went out and, and I sat down and put my arm around this guy and I said, tell me what's going on. And um, he was drunk. He had lost his job that day. Um, he had reacted very poorly to losing, losing his job. Uh, and he yelled at some people and scared a group of kids. And he was taking that scaring of the kids really hard. And so we sat and we talked and he had a duffel bag and uh, it was cold. Um, it was probably nine o'clock at night. Uh, he was shivering as he was talking to me, not to mention the fact that when you're under the influence of alcohol, your blood is thin uh, and you get colder faster anyhow. And um, I tried to get him to come into the church and pray. He wouldn't come in. So we prayed out there and, and sat and talked for 45 minutes or so. Um, and I wanted, I was trying to get out of him where he was going to go for the night. And he wouldn't tell me. Um, he kept saying, but I'll, I'm going to vacate your, your premises. And, and I kept telling him, I'm not worried about you being here, man. I want to know where you're going to make sure that you're okay. And he wouldn't tell me. And I said, at the very least, let me give you a coat. Because if you're not going to tell me where you're going to go and let me help you with a place to stay, I need to at least give you something to keep you warm. And thank God, Jean still blessing people, even after her death, had given me a wonderful winter coat that was pretty big. Most of my coats wouldn't fit this guy. He was like 6'3", mm -hmm. a big man. I am not what you would call a very big man, um, in case you haven't noticed. But this coat was nice, and it was big, and it was hanging up in here. So I was able to come in, grab that coat, and give it to this young man, and I knew it was a heavy-duty, it was a, it was a, a farmer's worker's jacket. So it was a coat designed to be outside in the cold working. Um, and I was able to give that to this young man. Uh, I haven't seen him since, don't know what's happened. I, I programmed my phone number in his phone so he could call if he needed anything, but I haven't heard from him. Um, and so those are the things we get to do. I don't know what'll ever happen to that man. I gave him a Bible and a devotional and I sent him Sent him on his way. Um, and it was actually very odd because I came back in, locked up, and walked out the front of the door, and he was gone. I, I, don't, I, I know he wasn't running. He could, he could barely walk. But I didn't see him down any of the ways. So I have no idea where, this, where the guy went. Um, but these are the things we get to do. Right? Martin Luther, in his wonderful little treatise, The Freedom of the Christian, says that the, the Christian is at once a lord over everything because God has given us freedom uh, by, by saving us from our sins. But at the same time, we are a servant of all. And as the servant of all, we don't get to decide if we're going to help somebody. We only get to decide how. So we see those people and we, we give them out of our, out of, out of our in their need. Um, now there are times, we've talked about this before, I think, where we can give in the wrong way that is detrimental, right? Uh, a young man that's already drunk, I don't give him cash, right? Uh, he's not in the frame of mind to make good decisions, probably. I don't give panhandlers on the side of the road cash. I will offer to buy them a meal. I will I'll offer to, to work with them to try to help them find a job, uh, I do those things quite often, and you know how many take me up on those offers? Very, very. It's not zip. I have had people that said, "Would you really buy me? Would you really help me find a job?" And I've had people that have come back to the, this church with me, and we've sat down in front of a computer in my cluttered and messy office, and and we've job searched, and I've sent them places. I've called other pastors and and said, "Hey, I've got I've got someone that that needs some work. Do you got custodial work or anything like that?" that 
that they can do. I've had them come out and I've had them weed before. Um, just a, just a, okay, you've weeded for me, now let me go buy you a meal. Or you've weeded for me or you've come and, and helped clean, clean the floors in here. Let me, let me, I'll put you up in a hotel for a night. Something like that. To have them earn, right? That builds in their mind that, that we're, we're making, we're doing things to earn and not just, just be given. Um, and then there are folks that we help out of this church that have terrible life situations, that have health problems that prevent them from actually working. And, and, and we do help in those ways. I still never give cash. Uh, Trish and I had to have a hard conversation when we first moved here. You know, as a, as a young pastor in a new city, you just want to help everybody. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about our hack fund at that time. Uh, and so I was helping people out of our, out of our money. And she looked at me and she said, if you keep doing this, we are not going to pay our bills. <laughs> so you got, you got to stop giving everybody everything. Um, and I quickly realized that my, well, I was maybe doing things that were hurtful because I was giving money. And so I, I changed it. And now I only use the hack fund so we can track what we give. And that money, if we help, it only goes to, like when I help pay rent, it has to go to the landlord. Yeah. And the check doesn't get made out to the person. The cash never goes to the individual. It goes right there to ensure that we are helping in the right way. Now, people have, there are people outside of the congregation that, that know this. And so what they'll do is they'll spend all their cash and then they'll say, oh, I need money for rent. So I know, I know, the, I know the games and I know the people that play them well enough now after being here for five years that we, we work around those things. Yeah. And, and I've helped before, but there have been times where I've said, well, because people haven't paid this money back into this fund for me to continue to help, I don't have enough to pay your whole rent. I can give you this amount um, so that they're still forced to have to figure out the, the other side. And so there are, there are we, we work, work things like that. Um, but all of that is done to be able to share the gospel. Right to uh, when I did, would do food deliveries during the the lockdown, I sent devotionals with every one of those deliveries, um, and I would write personal messages inside the devotionals. Now I've never had anybody come back and thank me for the personal messages inside the devotionals, which means I don't know how many people actually read them. But who knows? Who knows if they take them out and they set them on a shelf, and ten years down the road when their life begins to fall apart, they find that devotional. They open it, they see that personal message, and they read the Word of God, and that sparks faith. Who knows? It's not for us to know. We, we, like the Scripture says, right? We scatter. God does the growth, and He does the harvesting. We don't. We can put, especially as pastors, put a lot of pressure on ourselves to try to see those things and be critical of ourselves when someone leaves a, a, the church or we, we spent a lot of time and effort with a, a family that then doesn't become a member. But that's our own sinful pride that has to see those results. But you're planting the seed. That's, that's the we point. We don't know. Yeah, that's the point. Right? That's the point. But, but even in planting the seed, you can convince yourself that you have to see the growth. And that's what I'm saying. That's the pride. That's because right. we're sinful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and every seed absolutely. has to have patience before it grows. And every seed has to die before the plant grows. And Jesus, Jesus says that, right? Unless a seed enters the earth and dies. Now, he was talking about his own death and resurrection, of course. But, and don't dig it up. Yep. Yeah, and don't dig it up, right? Don't dig it up. Now, I will say that sometimes we as Christians have planted those seeds, and we do get the opportunity to go back and do a little weeding from time to time. <laughs> Right. Um, so I, there have been families that I've helped that, that didn't come into the church and I didn't hear about, from them for years. And then all of a sudden life, life happened again and they needed me. And so then they called me back and I, I re-interject and I go and I do a little bit of weeding right, to help out. And then I don't hear from them again. But once again, I'm just tending to the garden and, and God will, will do those things in his time. Settle down, boy. You're going to be okay. Um, so we've, we've talked about the imperatives from the first imperative to everyone, then the church, and now the individuals. Um, and so 
We as Christians have to expect these types of things, right? We, we expect that the world will hate us. Uh, Jesus tells us to expect that, right? Don't be alarmed because they've hated me. And, and we do have to understand that in, in the rejection of the message that we carry, that that is not a rejection of us. Right, um, Tanner, as at seminary, and, and he, uh, with the church that he's doing field work at, went and did uh, like a state fair or something like that, and they did up a, a booth uh, trying to get people to come to a Bible study. And the comments that Tanner got from people, the hateful, nasty comments that he got, he began to really take personally because Tanner's a young guy and he hasn't tempered these things yet. And he texted me and was like, I can't believe people, blah, blah, blah. And so I just... I just literally text him, don't be surprised if they hate you, for they have hated me first. And I just left it. And he called me later and said, that is exactly what I needed to hear, because I was taking it as them hating me. Mm -hmm. And I took it personally, and I said, yep, that's your sinful pride again. Right? We do that, though. Was there any particular theme to that hatred? There's just, there is an open, if, I mean, if you, if you don't share your faith outside of these walls in very public settings, now it's, it's, you, you get a little bit better reception, I think, even people that don't want anything to do with Christianity, like let's say you're at work, Mark, and you share your faith, you've got a relationship with those people. Um, if you don't have a pre-existing relationship, people can be pretty nasty because they don't care about the effects of their words on you. Um, and there is, I mean, most Christians don't even have an understanding of what this book says. So our enemies certainly don't anymore either. But like even and polite people who people are, aren't polite are anymore faith, would just go, well, no, thanks. Not this and he got some of that. Yeah. Uh, come on, nasty. That's this is, this is the world we're living in now. Wow. Yep. You we have, what? we have gone to one nation under God to one nation that despises God. And many people are openly hostile. Not because they actually know what the faith is. They know a caricature of the faith. They know a version of the faith that, that there is a vested interest in this country to promote. The fact that we are hateful and bigoted and, and all of those things. And so they, any Christian that tries to share their faith with folks that already believe that about the church. You're already in the crosshairs. Wait, and people come out swinging. You could see if they were exposing... At, at MPS school? No. Because um, Alicia said, God bless you to one of the, her friends when they were sneezing and she got in trouble. Yep. And um, This is where we've come she now. She was saying, um, go tell by the mountain. And, she's, and they said, if we, you say it again, you're going to get in trouble because she's talking about the word of God. Yep. And they, can't, they don't even say pledge of allegiance anymore? Nope. They and the, 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 great, the great irony is you could talk about the Quran mm -hmm. and no one, will, no one will bat an eye mm -hmm. in a Milwaukee public school. You know, I had a former co-worker and I liked her. She was a nice lady. Yep. She was very intelligent. And she would say she would never send her kids to a parochial school because that's just brainwashing. <laughs> and I told her, well, I went to a parochial school for nine years, and I learned not just about God, right. but about literature, and they really stressed reading. There's a lot of good things in private schools. And then she got kind of quiet. I don't think she realized it about yeah. me. Yeah, she thinks it's, oh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. thought you were an ally. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like well, just because you're a Christian, that doesn't mean that you're ignorant. Well, and this, so, is, this is the great lie that we've, believed in our education system is that parochial Christian schools are the ones brainwashing. But it's actually parochial Christian schools that have the deposit of faith in the Western tradition that teach free thinking. Right. It is the public schools that are brainwashing because you only are presented with this very narrow view of the world. And if you go outside of that lane, you're in trouble. That's the great lie that we believe. Right? Okay. That, oh, oh, yeah, I want my kids to think for themselves, so I'll send them to broken Yeah. Anything about the nope. God. Nope. And when she, if she were, it's like one time um, your wife gave her yeah. a cross neck bracelet. Yep. She had to take it off and put it in her backpack because she couldn't have anything like that at school. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I actually think that's illegal. Yeah. Yeah. That's illegal. 
you talk about the word of God and you're 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 pushing that a theme towards people that don't does not believe. But these public schools, they can have the rainbow theme and you got push it. the yes. Well, and and this is the, this, agenda. <laughs> the problem is that Christians have become quiet. We should be fighting that, mm-hmm. right? Yes. We should be saying something because that is illegal. Yeah. They cannot the 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 um. In the Bill of Rights, it's not freedom from religion. It's freedom of free exercise of religion. And if that free exercise of religion is the fact that you would like to wear a cross necklace, you, you are there and able to do that. And it's not, it's not the school pushing a religious aspect. It's a child sharing their faith. Yeah, yeah We ran into the same thing when we were down in, in uh, when we lived in Florida before we moved back to Indiana for the seminary. Kayla was in kindergarten. And we bring our kids up to pray before meals. And Kayla would pray by herself before meals. And it was a public school. Now, because they actually did it right, like the teacher can't hold a prayer, but because of the freedom of free exercise of religion, the school cannot stop a child from praying. This is what the Supreme Court just said with that coach that prayed on the sidelines. You cannot stop someone from praying. Right? The teacher, when we had parent-teacher conferences, very hush-hush, said, thank you for having a daughter that would pray because she was Christian. Mm -hmm. The teacher was and knew she couldn't because of the constraints, right? Uh, And yet, the school cannot stop a child from wearing a cross necklace. They can't. That is illegal. That, that That is them denying her a fundamental right for free practice of religion. So you get me the principal's name and I'll call him. I won't use your daughter's name, but I will call him. Well, when I was a kid, the kids at the public school during the week of Lent, like a lot of activities were canceled. Because right. Even though it's a public school, a lot of those kids went to yes. church. Yes, yep. You know, we don't do that. We have, you better we've, not talk about Lent. It might offend someone. It might offend someone. And God forbid, God forbid you, you come into school with a, a ash cross on your forehead, right? right. They yeah. Really yeah. Now you're forcing off. your religion on me, right. which... The great irony is, as you have said, the symbols of the secular humanist religion and all of it that it encompasses are everywhere, right? Um, just drive around this neighborhood and look how many signs are in yards with, uh, in this house we believe, secular humanist creed, right? There are, just so you know, there are rebound signs uh, that are, are now that you can put this in this house we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Right, so if you want to counter some of this stuff, you can get those signs. So that's, too. What those, that's what those signs are. Those we believe signs. Yes, they're yeah. black and then they list a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and if you notice, they're rainbow colored uh-huh. for a very particular reason, uh-huh. and then they list these these empty platitudes. Love is love. Kindness is everything. What does that even mean? The difficulty is that they have so elasticized the terms. That who gets to define what kindness is or what love is? Well, it's me. It's not you. My definition is all that matters, right? Whereas we as Christians would say speaking out in love is to tell someone when they're going down the wrong path. That's love, right? If you love your children, you corrected them growing up, right? You didn't just let them do whatever they want to, even a whiny little one. Right? You don't let them do whatever they want to and just say, oh, well, I guess that's just the, God, the way God created them. Yeah. My niece always says, well, when they grow up, they'll be fine. <laughs> no, they won't be fine. They're horrible now. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? If you, do not, if you do not bring your child up in the way, which I don't know, maybe read some scripture because that was a quote from scripture, right? Bring your child up in the way. Uh, fear and admonishment of the Lord. That's what we're called to do as parents. They're not going to figure it out. And if they do, it's a miracle. Yeah. Right? Uh, we don't allow kids, but this is, this is the other great lie. Right? This also comes from the education philosophy that is embraced in the public schools. The great lie that an a child is inherently good or a child is at best neutral. And neither of those are true. They fundamentally deny what we as Christians believe about original sin. A child isn't inherently good. You hear mine? They're not. I I didn't teach him to hit his brother 
when his brother takes his car. He does that naturally. <laughs> and we confess this every Sunday. I am by nature sinful and unclean. By nature. So the kid will not grow up and become magically good because of this inherent goodness that they tend to figure out. This this is the psychological approach to raising children. It's all about their self-esteem. And they've got this spark of goodness that's in them. That if we give them the right education, and if we give them the right social setting, they'll just blossom. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been talking about this since the guy named John Dewey in the 1930s. Where is this great civilization? Where are all these great people? There isn't any inherent goodness in us except the goodness that our Lord gives us in baptism. We have to hang on to that. Anybody got a clock? 10-10. Okay. I'm going to have to wrap up so I can get over to the other. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad you're... I got my phone. I forgot to put on my watch and my phone is doing the live stream so I can't see the clock. Um, Yeah. So, um, next week we will pick up at what should be paragraph number three. And it begins with, next comes what is sometimes called the golden rule. So on your notes, that'll be paragraph number three. Next comes what is sometimes known as the golden rule. Any questions before we close up today? Good discussion, friends. I've missed being with you. It's it's, uh, hard to go back and forth and do those things. Um, But it's, it's also good to get two different perspectives and two different ways of going at these things too, which is great. So the only downfall is Pastor Hasselbrook and I never get to teach together, which I think would be a lot of fun. Um, although very long-winded, if you came to the service walkthrough that took three hours, when we teach together, we don't stop. <laughs> I, I have noticed, What's good? Though, I have noticed good. as Pastor Hasselbrook yeah. kind of gets into you know each lesson, yep. he is starting to kind of discuss more good but open conversation as opposed to yeah so you you i mean when you first get to a congregation you got to learn personalities right you got to learn the setting of the congregation it takes a few months to to do that and then when when you get that done then that that kind of opens up i mean i know what's going on in a lot of your lives because we talk regularly and in that we're able to to tailor these things and so that'll just get better and better better and better. Consequently, it'll mean that we get through less and less in accordance with the notes, but you know, that's okay. Maybe, maybe when we get to the port of Jesus' ascension, he'll actually come back, and, and that time will be beautiful. Right. That would be so cool. It would be pretty cool. It would be really cool. But on the other hand, getting to know somebody, you go into the, you go into that, into your lives, yep. which means which means, I think, means a lot more to, oh, for sure. to somebody that yeah. is actually trying to live their own yep. life. For sure. And get references of yep. where you're supposed and to And that's, that's why Pastor Hasselbrook and I don't ever get mad or complain about getting busy. That's why I've gotten, I've, I wake up at 4 a.m. and come over here to work on my dissertation every day. Because when you all get up, you need things. And I want you to need things, and I want you to call me and text me. Because that means I'm actually being your pastor, right? I don't want you to not do that because you think I'm busy. I want you to interrupt me during the day. I want to have to get up at 4 a.m. because you guys are bombarding me all day long with things. Because that means I'm being your pastor. And that means we have a relationship to where when you need something in your life, I'm the one that you turn to because you need me to apply God's word to that. I need Linda to call me when Richard goes into the hospital because she's worried about him, which happened last week. And I'm glad you're home. I'm glad to be and that's a blessing. Too. It is a blessing. But it's a blessing to be able to be part of your lives and do those things. That's awesome. That's how the body of Christ works. That's what we do as Christians. And that's a beautiful thing. So I'll get up at 4 a.m. every day for a whole year to get that stupid dissertation done if it means I have the whole rest of the day to be in your life. Mm-hmm. and to do the things that I'm called to do as your pastor. Right. That's the way we need to be. And it's a beautiful thing to do. Yep. And that makes us know each other in a way that when we're going through God's word, I, if I'm doing my job, can strategically apply it to things that I know is going on in your lives. Even if it's generally here where I don't say something specifically, but there are times where I know who's sitting around the table and what they're going through, and I can say things 
in a way that is directed directly at you without you, everybody else knowing it's directed directly at you. I do that when I preach too. So if, if, if I've ever said something and you thought, I feel like he's talking just to me, there's a really good chance we've already talked and I know what's going on in your life and that was meant just for you. But in meaning it just for you, there's probably three other people in the congregation I may not have talked to about something that they're going to think that it was just for them too. That's the beauty of the Word of God. Yes. Amen. Woo. I used to go through that with Pastor Coker. Good. Good. That means he was doing his job. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, he was. Good. All right. Let us close with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, everybody. That's for each of you. We'll bless the